where are we at in terms of equity? So what what is the reality for somebody going into the workforce now and then trying to move up? Um, what are the problems and the struggles that perhaps we think are gone, but are still there? What, what do we have to deal with? So what's interesting is that, you know, women act, actually graduate from college in higher numbers than men do. Women go to more grad school than men do. I think the numbers are, are pretty close to equal when it comes to business school. These numbers change all the time. But there's no, there, it's not like men are getting more education than women do. But there've been a lot of studies trying to figure out why women may start in jobs at the same numbers as men, but don't end up at the top of companies in the same numbers as men. And one of the key theories, and this was something that was sort of articulated by a Lena and McKinsey study is this idea of a broken rung. Women get promoted at the lower levels, but then there's a sort of a leap to more of a management level where often women just don't get those promotions. And interestingly, it doesn't necessarily seem to have anything to do with performance. It can have to do with how much women are pushing for promotions, or maybe they are, are sort of inadvertently penalized for taking time off uh, from work for you know for maternity leave etc so there's so many different reasons but one thing that i really focus on in this book is i look at the tech industry in particular because the tech industry has more of a gap in in venture capital funding than in any other industry you'll see in terms of representation so we all know that tech companies are incredibly powerful they impact the way we live our lives the way we travel the way we order every product to our house or the amazon like there's no company tech their tech companies have massive influence over everything and tech companies are funded by venture capital whether it's facebook or airbnb google all these companies exist because venture capital fueled them and allowed them to grow massively while they were still losing money. So I wanted to look at this sector because this is the sector with the craziest gender gap. Women, on average, female founders, have gotten 3% or less of all venture capital funding in the past 10 years. So if you look at billions of dollars in, in, in venture capital, like $30 billion last year, 3% of it, actually 2021, 20, it was 2%, 3% or so of that money goes to companies with female founders. That's it's absolutely crazy. insane. So, so that's, it, that's the reason really why that's sense. it doesn't really make sense. So yeah. I really want to focus on that world just because the gap was so crazy that I wanted to understand a why that was happening and b how the women who had defied the odds and had managed to get that tiny piece of venture capital funding, how they had done it. I wanted to know their secrets because I thought these women are by definition exceptional and I really want to learn from them. So so we'll unpack why some women did receive VC funding, but that's a really interesting stat. So I would have actually assumed that in, yeah, of course you think of uh, tech as like, oh, there's, you know, the tech bros and whatnot. And there's this like, sort of like a, a negative connotation with the tech bro SF startup. But the numbers that tech is worse than some other legacy industries is absolutely insane. So if 3% yeah. of, of female founders are getting VC money, it's very obvious why there's not it's a actually, lot of... It's actually slightly more complicated. 3% yeah. of VC dollars go to companies with female founders, but okay. it's 6% of deals. And what's interesting is because, you know, each deal is like the check that's written. Yeah. What that means is that women's checks are smaller than the checks that men are getting. If they're getting 6% of deals and only 3% of dollars, it means the checks are on average small. So why is that? That's a huge problem to solve for right there. It's another problem too. So there's so much in here. And I, I just wanna be clear, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone. I think what's really interesting about this is I don't think there's one group, one person, no, no one group or organization is to blame for any of this. This is layers upon layers of structural, historical, societal patterns that have established this system and it's very hard to break them. What I was most interested and in, impressed to learn in my research is just this concept of pattern matching is hugely powerful. Pattern matching is this idea that if you're a VC and you wanna make an investment in, in, a, in a founder, your instinct and the data would indicate that you should invest in someone who matches a pattern. You should invest in someone whose company is similar to another company you founded. Maybe you have a habit or a pattern of investing in people who were engineers at an Ivy League school and then founded an enterprise software company, um, which they sold. And now you want to invest in these as second time founders. If you're looking at that subset of a founder, you're going to be looking mostly at men. So it becomes this feedback loop where people just invest in more and more of the same types of people. Part of it is that if you're a venture investor, 
you're making some big bets and you want to control every factor you can control. So if someone reminds you of Mark Zuckerberg, that could influence you. There's some crazy quotes in my book I've heard um, this from before. DC saying, I'll invest in anyone who reminds me of Mark Zuckerberg. But I think that um, it's just this instinct to go with the familiar. And also, when you're an investor, you're going to be spending a lot of time with these companies you're writing big checks to. And so you want to make sure this is someone you like and don't mind spending hours upon hours with. So there's also this instinct to invest in people who feel like your friends. Maybe they went to your same fraternity, you know, for same college or in your same fraternity. So I think a lot of that is this sort of, it's a pattern matching, which is a symptom of unconscious bias. And the more we could just recognize it, the more there's a huge opportunity to break the pattern. And there's financial opportunity in, in breaking the pattern. There's um, a VC I interviewed for the book named Josh Kopelman from First Round Capital. It's a fund in, in Philadelphia. He had a very successful fund. And um, after 10 years, he said, let's do a study and let's find out like what has been working with our companies. They invested in early stage companies. And early stage is when there's the most opportunity for bias because you're not investing in a company based on a five-year track record. You're investing in a company based on the idea and the founder. So he went back and looked at the results of his investments over the years. And he found that the female founded investments, which weren't, there weren't very many of them, they tended to perform better. And he thought, this is crazy. If the female founders, their companies are doing better, why aren't we investing in more of them? So he sort of took a step back and realized that there were systems they could put in place to make sure they weren't just, you know, investing in the in the obvious thing based on the pattern. So they before used to only have investors who had had a successful company that they had invested in. That limited the pool. And they said, why do we only have to hire people we invest in their company? Let's, you know, let's broaden the pool. So they started hiring different kinds of investors, more women, and women are twice as likely to invest in a female founded startup than men are. So they all of a sudden got this different pool of companies who are coming to them with their ideas because they diversified who their um, who their venture partners were basically. And then interestingly, they put these systems in place in their meetings to make sure that they were getting rid of bias. They'd hear a pitch and then instead of just opening, you know, having the founder leave and they'd open the floor for conversation, this is something that happens in meetings no matter what type of company you're in. They would um, have a, hear a pitch, like you could hear a presentation, but they'd have everyone write down what they thought about the company. Then they'd have a conversation. That way you didn't have one very loud, charismatic person railroad everyone else into listening to their opinion. And then everyone would be like, okay, fine, this guy's loud. We should do what he wants to do. This way you could get people who are maybe more introverted, maybe maybe more women who are less likely to want to go out on a limb in a male dominated room. And you could just let everyone share their opinion without, you know, without it having to be a public performance. And he found that the outcomes of implementing this system were really, really powerful. So I think there's so much upside to recognizing and stripping out the pattern matching and the unconscious bias.